What do you know about the Force? It's a power that Jedi have that lets them control people and make things float. Impressive. Every word in that sentence was wrong. There is a level of nostalgia in listening to Star Wars audio that's recorded off a of TV. <laughs> just the, the, the tinniness of it. I don't know. That's just what it does for me, and I have a little bit more. Uh, there's a reason why I did that, and I'll explain when we get into the show. Welcome to my nerd world. I'm glad you are with the show again this week. We have got a lot to get to, even though we're all currently parched and so very thirsty in the Star Wars desert right now. They're about to, in a couple of weeks, dump a massive amounts of water. They're going to drown us all in Star Wars news, and I don't understand why they're doing it all in one weekend. We'll get into all of it on the show this week. We do have some potential trilogy information about the Game of Thrones dudes. There's somebody showing up at Celebration, which has sparked a lot of interest as well. The show this week is brought to you by my science fiction space opera novel, Embark. Uh, marked it down again this weekend to 99 cents for the ebook. I will explain why a little bit later on. But you can go to Amazon.com and search for John J.O.N. Justice. If you haven't picked up my fun book yet, I would encourage you to go and do so. Let's not waste any more time. It is episode number 164 of the My Nerd World, a Star Wars podcast. Nothing will stand in our way. I find your lack of faith disturbing. I will finish what you started. Who are you? I'm no one. There are stories about what happened. It's true. All of it. The Force. Calling to you. My nerd road. Just that it So we got into this discussion on the Monday through Friday uh, uh, talk show that I do here in Minneapolis. Uh, Minnesota. We got into this discussion on the show this week. We were discussing the Fox merger with Disney, with Disney, um, you know, going and, and buying up Fox. And on the show, I, I, I mentioned briefly um, how nostalgic that 20th Century Fox fanfare is, how myself and so many people thought that that was part of the John Williams score going into Star Wars, and how cool would it be if they were to go and add it in some way, shape, or form to the beginning of Episode Nine before we get the A Long Time Ago in a Galaxy Far, Far Away. I, I think that would be really cool. What they should do, in my opinion, is they should do the Disney logo, but they should have, it, have the fanfare bring it up. Uh, I know they probably won't, and I could also see the argument of having some level of consistency between the three films, right? Suddenly now we're we're really paying fan service to get the to get the iconic 20th Century Fox fanfare back in front of the movies, but that would be pretty darn cool. So that really got my that got my nostalgic Star Wars feelings going. Uh, I had every intention of watching the Last Jedi last night because a handful of uh, <laughs> a handful of podcasters on my uh, at John J O N Justice Twitter feed, including Girls with Sabers, love you guys, got into this discussion about Raylos and doing a panel of Raylos, and and at one point, one of the Girls with Sabers had mentioned they would need a moderator, and I volunteered as tribute, and this blew up my thread. <laughs> this blew up my thread in the best possible way. I can't tell you, I have the my nerd world. Um, the Twitter feed, but my personal one at John J O N Justice uh, is the one I use most often, and normally that's filled with more political stuff. You don't have to go find that; it's unnecessary. Um, but I was giddy yesterday because my timeline was filled with all kinds of Star Wars and Raylo stuff, so that was awesome. So, um, because of that going on, I was going to watch the Last Jedi last night. Then something else ended up happening, and I decided to sit down and watch The Empire Strikes Back. And I will talk a little bit more about that later later in the show. Um, but getting back to what I did at the start of the show, we watched the latest Galaxy of Adventures, and it was a 
It was a one minute, 30 second short, like the Galaxy of Adventures cartoons are. Uh, and it was the Luke crashing his snow speeder and going up and, and taking out the, uh, the, the AT-80 uh, by, uh, by using the grappling hook and, and going up. And Melinda, my wife, said that, that would have been cool if they did it in the movie. I go, they did do it in the movie. Um, so we went, I was on YouTube, so I went and I found the snow battle on YouTube. Okay, long story. Holy cow, I didn't mean for this to take this long. So the clip that I found of the Hoth snow battle from The Empire Strikes Back on YouTube was actually lifted from an old TV version, so the sides were cut. And we watched that portion of the battle, and it just took me back. I have no desire to watch the entire movie that way, but to see a piece of the original trilogy cut the way our old TVs used to be sized um, didn't look as weird as I thought it was going to because I've been so I was so used to seeing it as a kid and growing up moving out on my own watching and wearing out the the, the VHS tapes of it. So that's what brought me around to to playing the the, the quick clip. What do you know about the force? Because I pulled that, I just re- I just recorded that off of watching the movie from my phone, and just that tinniness of it. Uh, there's there's something very nostalgic about it. I don't know what else to to say. All right, let's get let's get into it. Thank you so much for joining the show this week. It's going to be a long one. There's a lot of listener feedback we got to dive into. So um, let's just start running down the list of things to talk about uh, that have nothing to do with any details of episode nine. I'm going to get into that. Okay. I know that many of you, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it, like to label the show like Mr. Positivity, and I am. Doesn't mean that I can't be annoyed by things, though. And I'm annoyed right now, so we'll get into that here in just a a minute. First off, this was dropped Friday. So I'm recording the rest of this now on on Saturday. You're going to hear it jumbled up. I've done a bunch of recording of all the listener feedback already, so I'm actually... The last thing that I'm recording for the show this week is the commentary portion of it. So if you hear me reference Friday later in the show, that's why I recorded this over two days. Anyways, and I always record it for live, so I don't go back and do any editing. um, Because I'm lazy that way, and I like to treat it like my talk show. So, Hayden Christensen is coming to Celebration. Okay, that's interesting. Now, I know he came to the last one. Okay, so this isn't... This isn't... um, This isn't something where you kind of go... What? Right? Okay, so he's been to the last one. However, um, I do find it suspect, and I am on board with a lot of people who have brought this up, um, talking about the potential of, of Anakin Skywalker being in Episode Nine, his appearance at Celebration, to have some relevancy to that. Um, we know that Ewan McGregor showed up on the red carpet for the solo premiere, and we also know that, that they were supposed to be announcing his movie shortly afterwards, right around that time, which is a big reason why he was there. I wouldn't be half surprised if we end up seeing that Ewan McGregor is announced to show up at Celebration, but they may be holding off on that one if they're deciding that they are going to do an Obi-Wan Kenobi live-action TV series. They'll probably keep his name secret. Now, Hayden Christensen is going to be signing autographs. That's what the um, press release said. There was no talk of him Uh, attending the episode nine panel however i do think it does lend some credibility to him being a force ghost in episode nine i think it i i personally don't think that it would be shoehorned in i think there would be a lot of relevancy to that especially if kylo ren is continuing to try to finish what vader started show me grandfather It would make some sense since we've already seen Anakin Skywalker in ghost form. And he would be looking very similar to the way that he looked at the end of of, of Return of the Jedi. I could absolutely see that happening. I also can't help but wonder if his name, if Skywalker is not going to be in the title in some way, shape, or form. Right? Now, a lot of this is based off of the theory that I put forward that Kylo Ren would be trying to track down artifacts relating to Vader and may find out about who Anakin Skywalker was, and that helps him to move towards the light side, discovering the truth of his grandfather that he had been lied to about all the time, right? If they go that route, it certainly makes a lot of sense to bring Anakin Skywalker back into the mix, and it also makes a lot of sense to put the name in the title. Now, if they don't go that route, which I have absolutely no idea what they're going to do yet because we haven't been shown anything, then uh, having Anakin's uh, Force Ghost in the film um, doesn't become quite as uh, quite as relevant. Um, I haven't been on the show yet. I'm going to be on Knights of Vader, 
later on today, and I know we're going to be discussing a bit of this, and I'm pretty sure that while um, I'm pretty sure that Zach is on board with Skywalker's name being in the title, he doesn't think there's any chance of a Force Ghost Anakin on Episode Nine. So I'm really looking forward to getting into that conversation with uh, Zach on Knights of Vader later on today, and then I'll certainly let everybody know when they put that up. I don't know what his release schedule is for his um for his show right now. But that was some pretty big, you know, that was some pretty big news. And on a side note, regardless of whether or not he's a nine, I just think it's great that that Hayden Christensen and even Ahmed Best, um, because with the big. Um, the Phantom Menace panel happening on Monday. He's going to be there as well. I just think it's awesome that these guys are getting the attention and the, the how happy the fandom is to see, even with all of the negativity that's, that is out there and has been out there. Thankfully, The Last Jedi took some of that heat off, but with all the negativity that surrounded the prequels all these years, it's awesome. Just like I said before, the last celebration when he was going to show up, that Hayden Christensen is so well-received at these events, regardless of whether or not he's going to be in Episode Nine. Um, I-, I watched Attack of the Clones last week, and I've talked about that movie before. I won't go down that road again, um, except to say that, oh my gosh, the moment that those Republic gunships show up at the end of that film, I can't tell you how much I love that that from from that moment in the Geonosis arena all the way to the closing um you know directed by George Lucas. I just it is it just I've said I'll keep hit I'll keep beating this drum man. Some of the best Star Wars there is. The action sequences are fantastic. The lightsaber duel, you get Obi-Wan, you get Anakin, Dooku, and you get Yoda. Then you get Sidious at the end. Then you get the Imperial March with the with the uh, with the clone army taking off into the galaxy and Bail Organa pounding his fist against the uh, you know against the um the, the they're on the that little patio right there at the end of the uh, film on Coruscant. Oh, it's just such amazing awesome stuff. All right. Let's move on. Um title talk, like I mentioned a moment ago. Um I do think that the title is not going to be anything that any of us had guessed. That's the only justification I can give to why they're holding on to the title until Celebration. Uh, Changed my mind a little bit on whether or not there'll still be merchandise. Disney is a pretty powerful organization. They now own like half of all of media. It's not quite that much, but you know what I'm saying with their purchasing of 20th Century Fox. Um, So I do think that it's completely possible that they were able to keep uh, print merchandise and still keep the title under wraps. I do think that it does have something to do with the fact that the title is going to be rather significant, and so they want the trailer to provide some of that context. I don't know what that is, but that's my belief. I will say this, and this is where the negativity is going to come in. I don't like the way that they're marketing this right now. We're going to get so much information coming out of Celebration. Right? It actually has me a little bit fearful. So we have the Episode Nine panel... Um, more resistance, Clone Wars. So we're probably going to get more Clone Wars footage released. Um, the the new uh, Fallen Jedi, right? Is that what it's called? The new video game. We'll get a trailer for that. We'll get a trailer for The Mandalorian on Sunday. On top of it, we're, we should be getting the Episode Nine title and and teaser. And again, I, I it doesn't feel like there's a movie coming out right now. I know we've seen some leaks, but in the absence of anything official, it just doesn't feel like this the, the marketing, because it hasn't, has gotten underway. And as a fan, I know we'll forget about all of this in three weeks, but up until right now, I just don't understand why they haven't fed just a nugget, a photo beyond what J.J. Abrams tweeted at the end of, of wrapping the film. Ron Howard, even with Solo, I mean, he was tweeting out photos of, in terms of production that gave people the opportunity to speculate a little bit. Um, you know, it didn't happen nearly as much because there wasn't as much weight on those types of leaks as there are for the saga films. But he still was he still was going and doing that. The Mandalorian, for crying out loud. We've gotten photos of R2 units. There was a photo that just came out of Taika Waititi voicing uh, potentially IG-88. You can see IG-88 on the screen. We've got a screenshot for The Mandalorian. Now, granted, The Mandalorian is probably going to come out a couple of months before uh, the uh, before Episode 9, but be that as it may, we still received this stuff, and I just this idea that we're just going to get this 
this Star Wars dump of information, in all in one weekend, I still would have I put money down that we would have had a title by now. And to me, this was the last week to do it. Because if you're not going to do it this last week, okay, then and now you're just you're you're basically one more week and weekend until you're into the week of well, actually, no, a little bit more than that. So we have we have next week and then the weekend after. Okay, so we basically have two full weeks before we're into the week of celebration. So maybe there's a chance they can still drop the title next week as sort of a final lead-in to um, celebration. But even then, you'll get well, you get two weeks worth of podcasts. I don't know. I don't like the way that they're handling it right now. And I'm very curious, and there is a part of me that is very excited to find out what the reason was. Was it really just because they were starving the fan base, or is it because this movie, Episode Nine, and the footage with it is going to spark so much conversation that they know that they can be safe to wait from title to footage? That's what I'm really hoping for. Because I don't want the Last Jedi teaser. I want the Force Awakens teaser. And what I mean by that is you can't wait, in my opinion, you can't wait as long as we've waited to get a title and then footage and then have that footage be as sparse as it was for that Last Jedi first teaser. So again, bit of a recap. Prior to The Force Awakens coming out, we had in 2014, in November, we had the 88 second teaser that gave us those smattering of clips that ended with the iconic shot of the Millennium Falcon over Jakku and the two TIE Fighters coming flying in. Ooh, by the way, I need to talk about that too. Hold on a second. Let me make a note. TIE Fighter. I picked up something yesterday, and I can't even tell you how happy I am with my purchase. Uh, TIE Fighter, uh, vintage. Okay, wrote it down, circled it. We're good to go. Okay, so we had that teaser. That teaser was actually a heck of a lot like that Last Jedi teaser. And we'll get back to that in a second. So we had the November teaser, and then we got the Chewie We're Home teaser trailer at Celebration. That teaser trailer was awesome. It was almost like a trailer. Okay? That's the kind of teaser that we need for Episode Nine at Celebration. I will honestly be happy, but still disappointed, if we get a teaser like we got for... Episode 8, The Last Jedi, in 2017. That teaser, I went back and just watched it again yesterday. Um, It was really sparse. (laughs) The fade-in and fade-outs were super slow. A couple of the shots were just the mountains of Octo and didn't really show much of anything at all. I really hope they deliver. And I'm fearful of their marketing plan so far because I fully believe that This is going to be the most of what we get. We're going to get the title. We're going to get the teaser at Celebration. And then there's going to be a long stretch of nothing. We're going to get probably some, maybe a Vanity Fair article at some point in time. Maybe an Entertainment Weekly article with photos. But we're probably, we're going to go from April and then not even until October. So, April, May, June, July, probably another five months before we end up getting the full trailer. So I really hope, for the sake of the podcasters out there and for the fandom, (laughs) that J.J. Abrams Abrams delivers a knockout punch with that first teaser trailer. Because right now I do not agree with what they're doing with the marketing. Okay, let's move on uh, to the next item this week. And it is a bit of a spoiler. Um, so we'll get into it anyway. Well, not even really a spoiler, so we won't go with that. We'll go with, um, well, we'll go with this one. Let the past die. Kill it. If you have to. That's the only way to become what you were meant to be. Star Wars News Net released uh, some information this week. And as a matter of fact, I will go ahead and pull up the article for you so that I can just read to you what was said specifically rather than going just off of my memory. So there was a lot of speculation. And somebody had come out and dropped a rumor recently that um, Ryan Johnson's trilogy would end up being the, the next trilogy. Okay, uh, and I think it was Fantha Tracks had 
put out some um, some details about some IPs or websites or copywriting that was being done that showed that Disney was getting ready for some more productions and this kind of thing. And the, the, the speculation was that it was going to be Ryan Johnson's trilogy. Okay. Ryan Johnson does have a movie coming out this year called Knives Out. comes out, I believe, in November. He's in post-production on that right now. What we're hearing now and what Star Wars Newsnet is reporting, that actually the plan is that we're going to be getting the Game of Thrones, Benioff and Wise first Star Wars film, uh, and it'll be set well before the Skywalkers and begin filming this fall. So let me go ahead and read to you directly from the article. A contact who has worked on every Disney Star Wars film has shared some interesting information. According to them, the next Star Wars, Star Wars film could possibly begin filming this fall, and it will be the first film in the series by... Uh, the Game of Thrones showrunners, David Benioff and D.B. Wise. First off, um, I'll just say this up front. If they're filming this fall, I think that that lends itself to another December release. So I think that we could be getting an announcement at Celebration here in a couple weeks of the Benny Benioff and Wise movie, specifically what, what it's about, maybe even some casting news, and a December 2020 release. Okay, be that as it may. Um, as of right now, it's a rumor. So use your pinches of cinnamon as you wish. Because of that simple fact, I can't say I'm uh, as confident as uh, in this as I am with the Obi-Wan Kenobi streaming service, uh, streaming service series report. Though the source provided proof that they worked on every Star Wars film since Disney's acquisition of Lucasfilm and claim they are over 95% confident this is accurate. So this is what they were told. Um, the source said this. Approached about working on the next movie this autumn. It's not the Ryan Johnson trilogy. It's the Game of Thrones guy's first movie. And it is set during the Old Republic as Disney wants to open up the Star Wars timeline and appeal to more Game of Thrones style audience. So uh, Star Wars Newsnet goes on to say this really seems so on the nose in terms of what fans have been wishing for from these guys. I asked for clarity on what else they heard about the project. They said, so the timeline is hundreds of years prior to the Skywalkers. So think almost Star Wars meets Lord of the Rings. I asked if there was any grasp on something tangible happening for this production yet, or if it's all strictly talk discussion based. And according to our source, the art departments are doing pre-production work as we speak. They said filming starts this fall and the art departments are in design phases now as the script is being finalized. That is all I know, but I am 95% confident this is accurate. Okay. Just gut reaction to it. I think it's awesome. Okay. They certainly have a lot of source material, Old Republic source material, uh, to go off of. I know a lot of people are talking about the Knights of the Old Republic. A lot of people are talking about Darth Bane. We know that Darth Bane was supposed to make an appearance in the Clone Wars. We get all that. Disney has already shown a desire to pull from what they now deem as legends and pull them into Star Wars canon. Some people were saying they want this to be set thousands of years before the Skywalkers in Episode One. I think hundreds of years works just fine, in my opinion. I'm personally excited for it. I want to know who's writing it. I want to know who's directing it. And I think this is a really smart way to go. This does get me excited. I like the idea, and aesthetically, right? I love the aesthetics of Star Wars. I'm a big vehicles guy. I just, I just adore spaceships and flying vehicles i've created some special ones for the follow-up book uh if you're a part of the uh, mailing list uh for the author part of what i do and that's all i use it for sometimes for podcasts but if you're on the mailing list and you've emailed talkshownerd at gmail.com and you've been on the mailing list you've seen some of the artwork already for the for the cover of the book so you kind of know what i'm talking about and some of the um, concept art pieces i just i love vehicles I love the idea of going back into the timeline and seeing what the galaxy looked like um, hundreds of years before the events and what they do aesthetically with the Star Wars universe. Those old Republic games were so much fun. I don't want to lose the the visual of what we see in Star Wars, right? And I almost think you can kind of echo the original trilogy, given that the galaxy was under the oppressive thumb of the Empire, and so you didn't have a lot of craftsmanship going on. It was more functionality than it was anything else. So I think you can actually go back in time and have it parallel that a bit at a time when they were just developing a lot of these technologies and space flight and travel and things of this nature. Um, 
So that has me really excited. And a lot of that is simply based off of what I've seen and played in the Knights of the Old Republic games, uh, which you can't help but think they're going to they're, they'll use that as a starting point in the art department. Uh, and then it just comes down to story. What kind of story are they going to tell? Uh, is this going to be, uh, you know, a, another story with core central characters, or is it going to be something that's more like George R. R. Martin's Game of Thrones, where we have different factions of individuals and families and groups of people? Will we get um, old school Sith? Can we invite that back into it? Are we going to see that? Um, the formation of, of Jedis and things of that nature. I mean, there's a, there's a thousand places that they can go. This does has me have have me really excited. And I also think it makes a lot of sense for, for, for Disney to, again, sort of kick open the timeline a bit. Let's go back in time and let's start. Let's start with a new starting point so we can start filling in gaps and expanding the universe even even further than we already have. And it also makes sense that we go from nine, which is the most recent end of the timeline, and then we go back in time. That's not the original trilogy, and we'll be getting sort of all the nostalgic stuff when it comes to the Cassian Andor series and the Mandalorian and filling in some of those timelines of the existing films. But I love this idea of going back in time and seeing a whole cast of new characters at a at more of a dawn of the galaxy type of situation. And it makes sense that we wouldn't be going anywhere else in the current timeline. And I do think that's where Ryan Johnson's going. There was that rumor that was out there. Who knows if it's legit, but there was that rumor out there saying that Ryan Johnson's trilogy was going to be done after um, episode nine, right? And that it would be in a completely different part of the galaxy. Now, one more quick point, and then I want to talk a little bit about um, this amazing purchase that I did and also uh, something that happened watching Empire Strikes Back. But um, we end nine, okay? We don't have any other films right now, right? We don't have any other spinoff films, and there's no talk of any spinoff films at this point in time. We know they're going to be focusing on the on the digital service and live streaming, okay? Um, let's take, we'll just say that the Benioff and Wise trilogy, Old Republic, that's all true. What if Ryan Johnson's trilogy um, is actually the extension to Episode 9? I'm not saying Episode 10, but I am saying that maybe Ryan Johnson's trilogy, while it takes place in another part of the galaxy, takes place in another part of the galaxy post whatever happens in 9 and the effect that it has on the galaxy. I really like that idea. Because you have the you have the ability for Ryan Johnson to tap into a new trilogy and give us a new cast of characters that we could all sink our teeth into again. Okay. Not to say we can't do that with Benny Off and Wise. Okay, let's just that's a given. For Star Wars to exist in the fandom, we need strong storylines, sagas, epic space operas. Like I wouldn't look at solo as a it is a space opera but it's a singular fun adventure tale that's just a great ride right but you can't really sink a lot of teeth into it because there's just not a lot of force stuff going on they need that so i'm sure the benny off and wise trilogy will have it and i'm certain that orion johnson's trilogy would have it but if it's post nine and the whatever effect that episode nine has on the galaxy then Disney's got options because if Ryan Johnson's trilogy works and the fandom really grabs on to whatever storyline that he creates, they can continue to run with that. If it just ends up being a series of movies that does well, but it didn't really connect with the fandom, maybe in the way that the original Star Wars movies did, right? Or depending on how the Benioff and Wise movies, then they still have the option of, okay, we're going to go back and now we are going to do nine. And we're so many years out with the Benioff and Wise movies and the Ryan Johnson movies that they're going to be able to have that option to play with. Okay. That, to me, makes a lot of sense. Come Celebration, I think we'll have some answers to if any of this turns out to be true. I think, if anything, we'll certainly get confirmation of the Benioff and Wise rumor because there's no way they're going to be able to go into production in the fall, not announce that at Celebration and keep that under wraps, and not start promoting that film for next year. My guess would be that they'll announce, if the Benioff and Wise trilogy is happening, they'll announce it at Celebration. We'll get maybe an idea who the director is, maybe an idea who the, who, who, the, who the writer is. Maybe we'll get a few of who the, who the leading cast members are and a, a, a sort of rough idea of what the 
storyline is going to be. That's all that we hear about it until episode nine comes out. That's it. They shelve it. They're done. It's Mandalorian, Cassie and Andor next year. And we should get some Cassie and Andor news in Celebration 2, right? All episode nine the rest of the year, all Mandalorian, um, the video game, Clone Wars, Resistance Season 2, and then we don't hear about the next film until nine is out and released, and then we're into 2020, and then we're back into the same timeline that we're in right now. That is what I expect to see happen here in the next few weeks. For Phil. A few more quick items before we get to all the listener feedback this week. And thank you so much for that. I really do appreciate it. Um, Watch The Empire Strikes Back last night. That movie is so good. Right? I do. I just, I love that movie. I, I love it in a different way than I love The Last Jedi. But those two films go so well together. <laughs> They're just done so well. And the... And even with The Empire Strikes Back being a product of its time, being made in the 80s, it is incredible to me how well that movie holds up. It is just absolutely fantastic from beginning to end. And the music is just some of the best John Williams ever made. I wanted to make this point, and I've mentioned the what is Disney trying to do with the Star Wars universe are they taking lessons from the Marvel Cinematic Universe and its success? I mean, it's impossible to not look at that and what they've done with that Marvel Cinematic Universe and then try to speculate on what Disney and Lucasfilm have been doing with the Star Wars movies to see if they've been trying to replicate that or if they've had a different idea altogether. I do want to say this, though. What they've done with Solo and with Rogue One in watching the original trilogy has absolutely worked. Watching The Empire Strikes Back now with the solo story so firmly planted in my mind really has a positive impact on watching The Empire Strikes Back. It really does. Seeing in my mind's eye a young Han Solo, knowing what he went through, seeing his attitude in The Empire Strikes Back with Leia, with Chewbacca, with all of it, it really has enhanced this film that I already loved in an incredibly positive way. It hasn't diminished any of it. The Last Jedi, different, and I'm going to talk a little Rogue One. The Last Jedi also does too, man. What The Last Jedi does in going back and watching The Empire Strikes Back and Luke's going in. When I was a kid and Luke went into the Dark Side Cave on Dagobah, that was bizarre to me and didn't make a lot of sense. I was just like, okay, that was weird. I, I, I don't get it, but it's Force stuff. Vader was there, head got cut off, Luke's face was underneath it. Oh, that's creepy and weird. We saw some lightsabers in the middle of the movie. Okay, really didn't think beyond it growing growing up as a kid. Um, Did later in years when you get more into the mythology of what, you know, Lucas was trying to say with the stories and what that really meant and the broader scope of the Force. But you watch The Last Jedi and Rey's experience of going into the mirror cave. And then what happens after that with Kylo, man, it is just, this is the core and the essence of star Wars. And it's so great. And I love it as much as I love the stuff that flies around. (laughs) I really, really do really enjoyed watching the movie last night. And even rogue one had did, it does a very good job of enhancing the film as well. Seeing the rebels attack the walkers, seeing the, the snow speeders going out in search for Han and Luke and just remembering the rebellion and even what Rebels the TV show has done has just just enhances just all of it. So I don't know what Disney's grand design is except to say that regardless of box office numbers, which we wouldn't even be talking about or caring about if it wasn't for stuff like Twitter, right? I'll talk more about that and listener feedback this week. Disney's done a great job with these movies. I love all of them and they've all done a stellar job of enhancing each other and expanding the universe. It's not smaller. It's bigger. We've got reference points now from all different parts of canon. It makes the whole Disney wanting to do and have everything be canon makes all the sense in the world. The finale to the season finale to resistance is fantastic. The last half of it is so good. What happens at the end of it? The, the battle that takes place, it is a geared towards kids show. This season, the second half of this first season has been way better than the first half. 
Um, it's not Rebels. It is geared towards a younger age, but I love what they're doing with the timeline. I love what they're doing and giving us a little bit more of the First Order and the way the Empire was. And this is what I find is so great about what Resistance has done is the thing that I felt that's been not lacking, but what's not in the sequel trilogy is sort of this First Order dominance in the galaxy. You watch Rogue One in the very beginning of that film with Cassie and Andor, and um, they're on the the rigs the, the rings of Kafreen. I think I said that right. If I said that wrong, I apologize. Um, and then all the stormtroopers are there, right? And they go to Jeddah, and they're in the, all in the city. Um, you had Saw Guerrera talking about the oppressive rule of the Empire. You never really get a full gist of that, apart from the First Order sort of launching their first big attack and destroying the Republic. Resistance gives you that by having the First Order go on the Colossus and basically take it over. It gives you a bit of that, oh, okay, we're getting a really good idea here. The First Order is beginning to spread its tentacles throughout the galaxy, and this is a little snapshot of this group of pilots that are on this this water platform. Uh, but that season finale, if you haven't watched it, go find it. Go on your DirecTV or wherever you get it, and and just even if you haven't watched any other episodes, go watch that last episode. That last episode of the first season the season finale of of resistance it is just pure just great fantastic uh star wars uh you will not be disappointed this is not going to go the way you think all right one more item before we get to listener feedback this week and this is me just geeking out for a moment okay uh, I've been telling my wife Melinda uh, that I'm hold. I've been holding off on sort of any big purchases of Star Wars toys uh, until Episode Nine because I really want to go kind of all out this year when it comes to Episode Nine. I'm a 46 year old child who hasn't matured beyond the age of 16, and I proudly admit that. But that being said, there's been this. Uh, they have this vintage series. The vintage vintage series of toys is fantastic. And they released, being a big vehicle fan, they released the Imperial Time Fight, uh, Tie Fighter, uh, in vintage um, Star Wars packaging. Okay, uh, it is an am- I I I been wanting to get it for a number of different reasons. One of the biggest reasons is it's scaled correctly. For those of you that collect any of the toys, the Tie Fighters, apart from the really big one that they released for the Force Awakens, the First Order Tie Fighter that was scaled appropriately for the Black Series figures. Okay. Um, the three and three quarter inch spaceship toys usually aren't scaled; they're downscaled, just to just to give them playability. They've always shrunk the wings, the panels on the Tie Fighters for all the toys, unless you buy like the diecast ones, right? But for the big ones, they've always shrunk the panels. Uh, and kind of as a nod to that, when Dave Filoni did Rebels, he actually designed the Rebels Tie Fighters based off the toys. The wings are smaller. This vintage version, this vintage version that they, this new vintage version they released has the full size to scale panels, the wings for the TIE Fighter. Uh, I haven't been wanting to spend $80 on it. <laughs> and several Walmarts around the country, Yakface is a uh, on YouTube, I'm um, sorry, on Twitter, Yakface on Twitter, collector, one of the best sources when it comes to finding stuff out in the wild of toys, um, has had put out that people have been finding discounted TIE Fighters at like $30. My local Walmart um, discounted the um, TIE Fighter down 20 bucks, So I went ahead and picked it up uh, yesterday. Opened it up. This is one of the greatest toys I've ever purchased. It is so cool. The color scheme is right. They It comes with a uh, with a fully articulated black series uh, vintage... vintage collection fully articulated tie fighter pilot uh comes with a removable ejection seat that he fits in he can even fold his legs down and there's detail in the cockpit and even looking in from the window it is so cool i told melinda last night i go this is not me trying to justify my purchase but this piece of plastic was done so well i was bummed i actually went and looked to see what other vehicles they had made for this line and all that they've made is the job the the skiff for the job of sail barge and if you've been following toys at all you they released a big to scale version of that to a handful of individuals who signed up I don't know it's it's really expensive I can't afford to get the big sails barge but this would be the skiff that goes along with it you can purchase in the store and they also made the uh, the hover tank from uh, from Rogue One which I don't really have any desire to get but if you're a collector and you like the vehicles and you have the opportunity to pick up one of these vintage 
these new vintage series TIE Fighters. I, I absolutely recommend it. Um, it just it is so cool just to take the uh, take the the pilot out and the ejection seat out and look at the detail inside of the cockpit. I was blown away um, by just how accurate it looks. Really, really cool. And um, sitting there staring at it, watching The Empire Strikes Back, enjoying my glass of wine, it was just like one of the most perfect Friday evenings that I'd had in a really, really long time. Leading into a fantastic Saturday morning because I get to uh, talk about Star Wars to you fine folks. Thank you so much for downloading the show. Let's move on. There has been an awakening. Have you felt it? All right. At the end of the show this week, for those that haven't heard it yet, if you're a new listener, I do have a short promotional piece for the science fiction space opera epic that I wrote called Embark. I am finishing the follow up this weekend. I'm really excited, guys. I can't I can't even tell you how excited I am. This weekend, I went ahead and marked just because I felt like it. I marked the ebook back down to 99 cents. Paperback is thirteen ninety nine, and then the audiobook depends on price. Narrated by me, you can get the audiobook anywhere between twenty four dollars and seven fifty, depending on if you purchase another version of the book. Um, thank you to everybody, as always, who have uh, gone and purchased Embark. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. But for you newer listeners, if you haven't purchased the book yet, I do have a lot of people that ask me, "Hey, how can I support the show?" I do have advertisers that run occasionally, Mac Weldon specifically. I have a new one coming on board very soon, so you, I always encourage you to obviously go support the advertisers on the show. But um, in, in the absence of any advertising running, please go purchase the book. If you're a reader and you like Star Wars, trust me, you'll, you'll enjoy uh, Embark. You really will. Uh, if you're not a reader, uh, you, you can pick up the audiobook or you know buy it for a friend. It's only a dollar. Go to Amazon.com, search for uh, Embark. Uh, John J O N Justice, you'll uh, you'll find it there, uh, and it would really mean a lot to me if you haven't picked it up yet. And again, if you enjoy the show and you want to support the show, that's a fantastic way to do it. And stick around at the end of the outro, and you can hear that uh, produced piece uh, for the for the book. And again, guys, I can't tell you, I can't even tell you how excited I am to get this next story out there. Um, I really had it. I really had a blast writing it. Um, I started it in October of the end of October last year, and really have just been. Um, spending every every day a little bit more and a little bit more on it, and I love the way that it's shaped out. Um, so please, if you, again, if you haven't gone and picked up the book, go and get Embark today on Amazon.com. The ebook is only ninety nine uh, cents. And if you want to see some exclusive um, uh, artwork uh, for the cover, which I really love, the uh, the cover stuff is fantastic. Tom Edwards did a great job. Draw me an email, talkshownerd at gmail dot com. Speaking of email, I need someone. To show me my place in all this. All right, we have a lot of listener feedback. You guys show me my place in all this. I grab your comments off of YouTube, and uh, when you email me, talkshownerd at gmail.com, and then I read them back to you and I commentate. A lot of emails from last week I didn't get a chance to get to. A lot of listener feedback from last week, so let's do that. Uh, I'm going to sort of paraphrase what a new fan of the show, friend of the show, and even newer Star Wars fan, uh, Amanda Bienko, wrote last week. Uh, she wrote in last week, and I read the first part. Uh, of her uh, of her email talking about uh, the podcast and her love of the last uh, Jedi, then Amanda gets into the the intense hate that uh, to the point on Twitter that people bring, uh, even to where they're saying that you're being paid to say good things about the last Jedi. Um, she says that she's found it's okay for women liking the movie since girls have ruined Star Wars. Twitter said that, not me, but the men have lost their marbles. Look, Snoke said it best, okay? Um, the darkness rises and the light to meet it. In this case, I'm going to flip it. The light rises and the darkness to meet it. And what I'm talking about is Twitter. Twitter is a wonderful place that I really believe, and YouTube as well, uh, Facebook to a lesser extent, uh, just, just because of the way that they're utilized. But Twitter specifically um, has been a, a wonderful for a lot of people who may have been afraid to express their opinion. Or their comments and put them out into the world. And it gives them the ability to do that. To break out of their shell. And certainly you can find a lot of great stuff on, on Twitter. But with that, you get the negative as well. And conversations that normally are reserved between just individuals talking you know, about Star Wars or their fans. Or, you know, or, or with their friends in private. 
That's usually where it used to stay. It doesn't anymore. Now there's an outlet where people can be anonymous Twitter warriors and try to substantiate their own opinion. It's fine. If people don't like The Last Jedi, I'm cool with that. It's all good, man. I'll watch it more for you. I'm watching it tonight. Um, I'm totally, totally fine if you don't like The Last Jedi. But don't sit back and tell me that I'm wrong for liking it. And I won't tell you that you're wrong for not liking it. And that's where, and that's where the problem rests. And we've all been there. We all have had those moments where we have this opinion, but we're not completely 100% sure on it, right? So we look for reassurance in other people. Some people take that to the point where they, they, they're they going to say the other person is lying just to substantiate their own opinion. And in, and in my view, it reinforces what a piece of art The Last Jedi is and what Ryan Johnson made because that's what not all art, some art does. Some art can be universally liked, right? But some art, art that challenges you, you're going to adhere to a lot of individuals who are going to adore what you've done. But with that, you're also going to create, because you took a risk, a lot of frustration. And The Last Jedi took a lot of took a lot of risks. I love it for that. I love that movie. I adore that movie. But I understand that some people, it may not be their cup of tea, right? It, it is unfortunate, though, they have to take to Twitter and spread so much of that hate. To me, that just speaks to their own insecurity. Um, she also goes on to talk about the appetite for anything um, episode nine and then wraps up her email talking about how how excited and nervous she is, interested in how episode nine is going to be um, promoted. And look, I can't help but wonder. And I mentioned this, obviously, earlier in the show when it comes to the title, because Amanda and thank you so much for the email, Amanda. I really do appreciate it. Uh, and I hope you keep listening. But I, like her, think there might be a spoiler in the title. Okay. I also have another theory. And we won't know any of this. And we'll find out soon enough, right? Um, I think that, like I said earlier in the show, with the addition of, of Hayden Christensen, uh, Christensen at Celebration, I think there's a good opportunity we could see. I think there's a, uh, a, a decent opportunity that we see a Force Ghost Anakin in um, Episode 9. That makes sense to me. He showed up at the end of Return of the Jedi. It makes sense that he would show up to try to wrap up this trilogy. Um, with that, I also think that the Skywalker name might actually be in the title somehow. You have to couple it with some other words. You can let me know. Talkshownerd at gmail.com. But, you know, um, history of the Skywalkers. The 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 legacy of of, of Skywalker. You know, I, I, don't, I mean, it could be any number of things. But I can't help but wonder if Skywalker's in the title. Promotion. Now, as I said, and I keep saying, I, I personally believe it's been a mistake that Disney and Lucasfilm have been starving the fandom the way that they have, especially heading into Celebration where we're going to get so much information. And, and like I said, it has me a bit fearful that we may not get as much as, we, as we're all hoping of Episode Nine stuff. But I also wonder this. I wonder if the promotional campaign for Episode Nine is going to focus on Rey and Kylo. And because the promotional campaign is going to focus on Rey and Kylo, they want to shorten that time frame and make it as intense as possible leading into the movie at the end of the year. Now, this would be me obviously speculating that because of the controversy of Last Jedi, they're playing it careful. I, I don't normally believe that's the case. I'm just speculating that I do wonder... That, all right, you know, let's starve the fandom and get him wanting Star Wars so much that when we hit him with the promotion of this film, and remember on the Skywalker portion of it, the line keeps, is the end of the Skywalker saga. I don't know how many times that Oscar Isaac has said it at this point in time, but it's the end. So again, I just, I can't help but wonder that's going to play a big, big part in it. And I wonder how much of the focus of the of the marketing campaign is going to be around not necessarily Raylo, except to say Raylo in the sense of the marketing will be Ray and Kylo, so we're gonna say the marketing's around Raylo. All right. More email. Cortex Zero writes this. Thanks for acknowledging me once again on the show. It's cool to hear uh, someone that you enjoy listening to read your comment on the air. I'll give you um, something quick to discuss on the next episode if you come across my comment again, and that is, what are your thoughts and or predictions regarding the upcoming fourth trilogy by David uh, Benioff and D.B. Wise? Most people I've heard to um, 
talk about it and myself are of the uh, belief that this new trilogy will be the Knights of the Old Republic. That's, of course, as we talked about earlier in the show, that's the big um, speculation at this point uh, or even earlier. What are your thoughts and what are some fun details you would really get excited about? Lastly, and this is the fun question, if you were chosen to write this trilogy yourself, what are some of the ideas that you would implement into it? Thanks again. I really enjoy the show and appreciate you being respectful of everyone and their opinions, Tom. Um, all right. First off, um, I'm sure you, if you were listening, Tom, you heard me talk about already the Benny Off and Wise um, story and my thoughts on potentially doing the Old Republic earlier in the, in the show. As far as what I would have done with the trilogy, with the sequel trilogy, honestly, that's a real tough one for me because I like what they've done. And I don't think, and this isn't really the fun part, right? But this is just my sort of thought. I think they handled the original three exactly the way they should have handled the original three. Uh, and, and not having them be the centerpiece. I've mentioned this before. I never needed the original three to be in the sequel trilogy, but it makes sense to go and have them there. Uh, as far as what I would go and put in the movies that would be fun, that's, you know, that's a, that's a tough one. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know what I'll say? Go read and bark. <laughs> I mean, look, I, I, I don't know, um, if uh, look embark and, and again this is not just a, I'm I'm using it as an opportunity to promote the book but it gives me gives me a chance again 99 cents right now just for the ebook 13.99 for the paperback on amazon.com search john j o n justice um but look if you want to know what I would have done with the star wars movie it's embark that's what I wanted to write now i wrote that story to be as much not um i don't want you reading embark thinking this is a star wars story it's not a star wars story uh i based it on earth i based it in the future the uh, the 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 love aspect the romance part of it that's in embark is is more based off of me right and the things that i like that's not necessarily sort of star wars related but the action set pieces are look the action set pieces of the book that i wrote and certainly the follow-up because the 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 first book embark that's available right now most if not almost all the action is based on flight whether it's uh whether it's in atmosphere or in space uh i really opened it up in the second book and there's a there's several different action set pieces that i would probably end up putting into a star wars movie where i had to have the have the chance so that's a very interesting way for me to get around your your question or a very interesting way for you to go and buy my book if you haven't bought it yet, because that's what I would do. The stuff that I did in Park. <laughs> All right. Uh, Ryan writes this. Ryan Lunky. Uh, let's see. Uh, I see you have a lot of listener feedback, so I'll keep this short and sweet. You wondered why Kylo would be chasing relics. This was the theory from last week. Um, and the possible answer dawned on me. Show me again, Grandfather. When Kylo first touched Vader's helmet, he had a force back vision, much like Rey had when she touched the saber. We don't know what he saw, but we can assume he was guided by the vision to finish what his grandfather started. This would even explain that he saw a girl in that vision, beckoning his odd reaction. What girl? That lightsaber. It belongs to me. Kylo asks the helmet to show him again, but to no avail. He sees Anakin's lightsaber. I bet he thinks it will show him something. Like more answers to what that helmet vision was all about and what the Force is trying to tell him. Kylo ends up chasing relics. And to the joy of the audience, we're going to see Force back visions tied to those specific relics. Oh my gosh, Ryan, that would be amazing. And that would be so J.J. Abrams to go and do something like that. Those visions give pieces of the puzzle. The relics lead him to what he thinks are answers. Doing that thing with my fingers, the MacGuffin, it leads him to Ray. The significance of them ending up together will then be explained. I can't think of any better way to reach back to all of the movies and tie it all together. Rather than awful, simple name drops like Luke named Darth Sidious. Which was cool, by the way. Kylo and Ray were about to have their force back. When they touched fingers, but it was interrupted for Skyping back connection, dropped call, if you will. It was incomplete force back. Next time they meet, 
They will uh, actually grasp hands. They will understand each other. JJ, is this you? The light will finally meet the dark completely in embrace and not in conflict. Balance will be achieved. All right, Tom, uh, to the last email, this is what I would have done. <laughs> this movie will have a lot of force back visions to tie it, to tie everything. They will occur when Kylo or Rey touch relics. It will take them to Naboo, to Owen's farm, to the to the Tanti 4 to Vader's castle. So many possibilities. We will see various scenes for context that otherwise we wouldn't get. Dropping Ben off at Luke's um, with Luke. Uh, buckle up, John, or I may be way off. <laughs> no, man, that's really, really cool. That is a just, that is a fantastic um, take on everything, Ryan. Um, really, as a matter of fact, I'm going to move your email uh, just so I don't lose it. Just in case, you know, it might actually pan out. But I I absolutely um, love that idea. All right, friend of the show, Bonnie Fisher, has a lot to say. Let's get to it. Uh, in 2018, Episode Nine was so far away, I felt like we could all be happy with our speculations, even with being told the movie was the end of the Skywalker saga. I moved happily along, imagining all the potential for Ben Solo, thinking surely they are just teasing us, and surely Ben Solo will still be breathing at the as the credits roll. I even clung to Driver's mention that he did know where his character was going from day one. I concluded the actor is playing Ben like he would be redeemed and therefore alive at the end. Now in 2019, I find myself in no man's land of of more information, but also not enough information. Sadly, recently, what keeps being repeated is how the movie will be a fulfilling end to the Skywalker saga. Gulp. Oof. Gulp again. I'm losing faith that Ben Solo has a chance of still being alive at the end. First choice. It is the end. Ben is redeemed, only to sacrifice himself for the greater good and die much like Anakin. While that might be fulfilling, it would lack originality, in my opinion. Q original trilogy. Second, Lucas' film is being artful, and it is the end of the Skywalkers, but Solo lives. And this movie is a love letter to Carrie Fisher, and that is why it's so fulfilling. Uh, since January 2019, I have to admit I'm losing faith, and I think we're getting the first choice. And although epic, we might have Ben's redemption before Princess Leia uh, and General Leia's death, and Ben sacrifices himself for the greater good and the credits roll. Okay, let me stop here real quick. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the email, Bonnie. Um... Look, honestly, I mean, none of us know what what JJ is is going to is going to do. Um, I, I know there's a lot of people that have really strong opinions and 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 have backed it up with a lot of fact. Uh, if it were me, and I'll just go back to Cortex Zero to Tom's question. If it were me, I would keep. Obviously, I keep Ben Solo alive. I think that he has to probably be exiled in some way, shape, or form to to face the actions of what he did. But again, Star Wars um, life rules don't apply uh, like they do in re you know real life rules don't apply in Star Wars. Laws don't either. So, uh, in terms of Ben dying, look for me. I said this all along. These are historical documents. That's how I'm going to treat them when I watch them. This is what happened, and I'll accept that. As long as the story is good, I'll accept that. I don't know which way is better because I haven't seen what they're going to do yet. So it would be, for me personally, ignorant for me to say um, it's a bad idea for them to kill Ben Solo. I don't know that until I've seen it and they actually go and do it. I do think for the future of the Star Wars movies that there are there are two ways to look at it. There is the, and this is the way that I believe, there is the we have to keep a bloodline going for the Skywalkers in some, some way, shape, or form. And in order to do that, you got to keep Ben Solo alive somehow. Okay? Or, you know, Ben dies and Ray's got a, got a baby Ben on her belly. <laughs> Hashtag baby Ben on her belly. Um, <laughs> so, right, I don't see that happening. Unless we're going down the midichlorian route and touching fingers is actually the, the way in the Star Wars universe that you procreate. And oh my gosh, wouldn't that be boring? Okay. So. There's that route. Then there also is the route where Disney and Lucasfilm decide to go bold. And they actually do, and this is what Bonnie, I think, was referring to, and I think that's a 50-50 shot. I think there's a 50-50 chance that if Disney and Lucasfilm have said, hey, look, the future of this franchise will not rest on the Skywalker blood alone. Okay, and we're going to end we're gonna end that line. You know, when I say that, though, that just seems so... If you wanted to, 10 years down the line, make another Star Wars movie and have a Skywalker be involved, that makes all the sense in the world. Hey, everybody, it's back. 
right? Uh, episode 10 is here. So again, I lean towards Ben uh, and uh, to, to end up living at the, at the end of this thing. <laughs> Baby Ben underbelly. All right. Girls with sabers. They're fantastic. I love you guys. Uh, hey, oh, friend, they write. I wanted Raylo to be a Kenobi since the first. It would be poetically beautiful if a granddaughter of Kenobi helped the grandfather of Vader to come back to the light. Kenobi failed Anakin. Ray helped Ben. However, poor Ben Solo. I feel like everyone would just call him a liar, but I will say no more. Ask Misconduct. She will expand and help us all. I know. And actually, Misconduct, there's a there's a there's an email waiting in here from Misconduct as well. So we'll be getting to it. Thank you, girls with sabers. I do love you guys. You're fantastic. Um, yeah. And by the way, getting back to to Bonnie's question in the future of the Star Wars franchise, I, you know the the Raylo thing works for me. Kylo and you know Ben Solo, redeemed Ben Solo and Ray go off together. That's the balance. That's how they wrap it up. To me, that makes the most sense, along with her being a Kenobi, because now you have the possibility of, let's say, for the sake of argument, in Episode Ten, that not only includes the Skywalker bloodline, but it's a combination of the Skywalker and Kenobi. I mean, come on now, who wouldn't want to see the son or daughter, right? Who's got equal parts Kenobi and Skywalker in him? I don't know if you knew what that was, but it was me blowing my own mind. <laughs> Regina writes this. My theory that Obi-Wan saved some genetic material from Padme at the birth of the twins. Somehow it ended up on Jakku and it, it was used for cloning. In fact, her parents were not her real parents and Obi-Wan knew about it. Look, based off of what they've done in the stories, that is certainly a big possibility, right? Um, it absolutely, that, that, that's absolutely a, 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 a big possibility because we have precedent for clones in the other films, especially the prequel trilogy. Okay. So my opinion on that, um, I don't think they do that. And this is completely personal on my end of things. Okay. So this is just, this is total subjective, um, opinion, uh, based off of what I like and what I don't like. I had a storyline in mind when I was writing Embark for the follow-up book. I had a I had a whole story written that was based off of cloning technology, right? Because it isn't all that difficult to think about the future in a world where we could actually go and clone humans. Okay. I completely changed it, and I ditched it. I ditched it because I feel like the cloning worked in the prequel trilogy with the with the troopers, with the clone troopers. But that's why it worked. That's why the, the Clone Wars cartoons with the dynamics between the clone troopers worked as well as it did. Because cloning a person that is carrying a story, to me, I don't think as an audience, as an audience member, as a viewer, as a reader, I don't take that character as serious. Wow, I'm totally cloning prejudice, aren't I? That's horrible. I'm a cloning it. I'm a cloningist. No, I just mean that that it'll always just be a clone, so it doesn't carry. You you you're, you're not. I think you on on page, and not you, um, Regina. But I think for me, I don't transfer the 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 way that I feel about the original person to the clone. I just think of the clone as a copy, so it doesn't carry the same kind of weight. So I just don't I don't see I could see them bringing back a clone army in 9, but I don't see any key characters being being cloned. All right, Kyle Bookout writes this, another great episode, John, even with a slow news week. I saw that leak too, not sure what to make of it. If it is fake, it just goes to show how starved the fandom is for anything to go off of. This would be the uh, the the marketing sheet for the chosen one uh, that we uh, that we talked about last week's episode. I can see how Lucasfilm would be doing this and catering to diehards like us, we can only hope. Yeah, and again, that just goes back to, and thanks for the uh, thanks for the message there, Kyle. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, again, that just goes back to this idea that Disney was intentionally going and putting spoilers out there. Uh, all right, SJ's writes this. I think bigger coincidences have happened than the Falcon being on Jakku in Star Wars. Going back to last week's episode of things that they could answer in 9 that I would appreciate. The Why the, why the Millennium Falcon was on Jakku. At least they explained that Han lost it or it was taken from him, and that's how it got there. Yeah, and, and SJ's, um, I'm not saying that you are uh, implying this, 
Um, and he also goes to write, uh, like how, or they do, I don't know if it's male or female, my apologies, um, like how Luke just happens to come across a message from his sister from R2, who's just lucky enough to end up on his planet and brought in by his uncle. Um, right. And I do agree with you. And if they don't explain those things, I'm fine with it. If they don't explain how the Falcon ended up at Jakku, I'm not going to be upset. I was just adding it to a list of things that for me personally, they could go and answer and I would be cool with knowing. But if it just turned out that, you know, the Irving boys stole it from Uncar Plutt, who stole it from du- Duquesne, however that went, because I totally got it wrong right now, um, then I'm totally fine with that. All right. Um, Sweet Sereni of Lees says this. If Raylo doesn't happen, I will be so disappointed and a bit salty. Salt. The movies hint to it so much, I hope it doesn't all end up coming to nothing. However, I'm confused why you don't like Mike Zero. His recent leaks seem legit and believable. Because Mike Zero, no offense, sweet. Uh, Mike Zero is a liar, and I don't believe that anything he's ever put on his channel has ever come to fruition. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure somebody tracked it. And said there wasn't anything on his site that wasn't taken from somebody else. Because he takes legitimate leaks from other people and puts them on his site and claims that they're his. So, yes, do not do yourself a favor. Do not waste your time with Mike Zero. Um, He does not have any inside sources. He steals from people that actually do have inside sources. And in my opinion, he is a stain on the YouTube fandom. And that's about as harsh as I'm probably going to get on this show. But I really do appreciate, and I like your name, sweet. If I said it wrong, I apologize. But I really do appreciate you writing, and I hope you do again. All right. Um, let's <laughs> let's go to Colleen uh, Falk. Great theory about Kylo. I think you nailed it with that idea. It would tie all of it together, uh, like we heard they would be doing. Um, such an aha moment, and we've heard it here first. At least I did. Uh, Ray Kenobi would be satisfying for everyone, so I think it would be a win-win. As always, thank you for your insight. I appreciate the food for thought. Thank you very much, Colleen. I appreciate your uh, your email. All right, uh, Colin Weatherford writes this. Uh, I had a thought last night that made me excited for the Resorge Skywalker Saber for the first time. I've been critical about that before, but if my theory is correct, I will worship the ground at JJ's feet. Okay, so we know Ray has reforged the Skywalker blade. My thought is, what if she did not rebuild the saber for herself, but rather for Ben? She has her own saber that she made, and that is the one that she uses throughout the film, preferably yellow. But she continues to carry around the Skywalker blade with her, much like Aragorn carried around the shards of Narsil until time, until it was time for Return of the King. So in my head, I hope, um, I so in my head, all hope is lost toward the end of the movie. Ben, uh, the last Skywalker, seizes the broken blade of his family and leads the final stand with Rey at his side against a new threat from the beyond. That's pretty good stuff, Colin Weatherford, and I appreciate your email. I just dig it. I love bows, says, the theory is amazing. Thank you, I love bows. I love you. Uh, all right, let's go. <laughs> Let's go to uh, Globetrotting Tiffers. I love your theory about Kylo Ren trying to follow his grandfather's footsteps, finding what actually happened, and then Raylo would be solidified. I don't want Ray to be a Kenobi, though. I love the idea of her really being a nobody and showing that the Force can come to anyone. This also goes along with Pride and Prejudice connection. Ray, Elizabeth, Elizabeth slash Ray not being people of consequence and becoming important because of who they are to their prince-like guys, William, Darcy, slash Ben. Keep the podcast coming. Always my highlight of the week. Uh, yeah, I, I can see that globetrotting, uh, globetrotting tiffers, and I and I totally understand and I agree with a lot of the parallels when it comes to Pride and Prejudice. Um, if I were to argue, okay, uh, if I were to argue, I would say that um, Kenobi isn't enough to strip away the Pride and Prejudice reference, right? I, I would still think, I mean, Kenobi was important, but he was important to us as viewers, not necessarily to the galaxy at large. Um I, and, and again, don't misunderstand. He's important to the galaxy at large and obviously a crucial part in all of what happened with Anakin Skywalker, but he's not the Skywalker blood. He was he was Kenobi. That's that's kind of what I mean. Um, but uh, but again, I, I do 
I do also like the idea that she ends up being a nobody, and so it's more of a direct parallel to Pride and Prejudice. All right, uh, Mike writes this. Hello there. I continue to enjoy your podcast every week and morning show each day. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Uh, thinking about the release of the much uh, thinking about the release of the much anticipated release of a title for episode nine in the upcoming celebration of Chicago, a thought came to mind. What a missed opportunity for, for Disney to bring in a huge amount of revenue if we don't get the title prior to, prior to celebration. There could and should be a lot of merchandise to to buy available to buy at celebration that would incorporate the title not officially releasing the title prior to celebration would create a huge risk of leaks as volunteers and celebration workers set up for the event um oh yeah and then his lastly thanks to you taylor swift's endgame has been stuck in my head for a couple of weeks now thanks friend i want to be an endgame um you know what i'm i'm coming around uh, not coming around but uh, I don't think we're getting. I, if we were going to get the title, I feel like this was the last week to get it. We're, we'll get it at celebration. We didn't get it beforehand. That being said, I can't help but wonder if they just really went out of their way to hide the title, and they still printed up a whole bunch of merchandise because the panel happens on Friday, so it does make somewhat sen- some. It does make some sense that um, they would have merchandise to sell all weekend, and maybe they just cho- chose one supplier who. All signed MDAs, not to reveal what the title was, and everything is under lock and key. Who knows? But I think it is uh, It is absolutely uh, that is absolutely possible. All right, let's go to... Oh, sorry here. Let's go to Amanda Sennett. Writes this. Great, prod, uh, great podcast, even from the desert. I love the idea of Ray being Kenobi. I know a lot of people went into TFA convinced that she was a Skywalker and have had a hard time getting away from that. I went into this trilogy with zero expectations. So her being Kenobi would be a surprise, to be sure, but a welcome one. Also, I about jumped out of my seat when you brought up your Kylo theory. That really has potential. Yeah, man, and Ryan Lunky from earlier really expanded on it. Going and grabbing relics to get Force Visions, and we get to see scenes from the past. Um, that would be tricky, by the way, because I, 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 I hesitate to want to see a Star Wars movie where they show actual scenes from the past, unless they were redone in a different angle we haven't seen before. That's what I would like to see. I don't want to see, I do not, let me be clear, I do not want to see actual clips from the other films in Episode Nine. What I would like to see is a recreation of an angle that we haven't seen before, like it was supposed to take place in the Force back in the in the, in, in uh, the Force Awakens. There was supposed to be a shot of Ray seeing Luke and Vader battling um, right before Luke, uh, Vader uh, cuts it, cuts Luke's uh, hand off, um, but they cut that out. Also, in The Last Jedi, the hologram that R2 projected when Luke got on the Millennium Falcon of Leia giving the speech that Luke Skywalker saw in the hut on Tatooine was a different take than what was shown in A New Hope. And if you follow what she says, there's a whole line missing in the way that she delivers that in the, in the force awakens. I, I'm sorry, in the last Jedi, I had assumed that that was done for time, but the reality was that was actually a completely different take of her doing the holographic recording. And I really appreciated it for that. All right. Uh, let's see. Um, the theory, it's an easy way to get Luke's force ghost involved in telling Ben all he knows about Anakin and pointing him in the right directions to learn more. And the icing on the cake would be if all of his searching leads him to coming into contact with Anakin himself. <gasps> we need Hayden back as a Force ghost. Yeah, man, I think we're getting it. I know Zach on Nights with Vader disagrees with me, but I think we're. I th- I personally think that we're. I think we're getting it. Friend of the show Jennifer Oliver writes in and says this: It would be cool if Kylo is trying to put Anakin Skywalker's story together, and he realizes that a, manipul- a manipulative dark side Sith Lord um, used Anakin's love for Padme against him to turn him, while comparing that to the manipulative influence of Snoke. It would be cool if they do figure out the Padme and Anakin story together, perhaps with her finding out she's a Kenobi and hearing the story from some obscure family member, how Obi-Wan wanted to help Anakin and felt he failed. 
I don't need her to be a Kenobi, and I don't I don't personally either. But it would be um, part of what um, of her that wants to help and rescue Skywalker. It would really I would really like Ben and Ray ending up discovering the truth about Padme and Anakin uh, together, or in some parallel way. You know, and I I, I wonder. And I, I love all the speculation and the possibility of, of what could happen with that. I just wonder, conventionally speaking, because there has been such a a lack of focus in the first two movies, if they go there at all, right? Uh, and that's why, while I like the idea of a, of, a, of Ray being a Kenobi, and some people have put forward some very relevant points in regards to that, you know, sort of the shrinking of the universe idea. Why does she need to be tied to Kenobi? Um, like my wondering why the Falcon was on Jakku, right? Uh, how that's not a big deal. Well, would it be a bigger deal if suddenly we find out that she was a Kenobi and the, the, and the, and the light side rose in her? I mean, you can justify that away saying that the Force had influence there and she was powerful uh, because of that and, and she was uh, her, her, her Force ability was enhanced uh, due to the fact that Obi Wan Kenobi has played such a uh, an important role in all of these stories and within the Force itself among these movies, and so again, that's a fairly easy way to go and explain it away. I just wonder, working through your comments and your theories on this, I just go back to all right. These are all really great, and I know that I started a lot of these, but at the same time, the focus has been these new characters. So, how much time are we really going to spend going back? And that's also a bit of a reason why I like that Kylo Ren theory. Uh, I like that Kylo Ren theory of him going and, especially the way Ryan had laid it out, going and trying to find these artifacts, trying to get these perhaps Force visions, or just collecting them and trying to finish what Vader started. Thanks as always for the uh, email there, Jennifer. Uh, Nicole. Uh, Valiza it says this, Ray being a nobody is what I personally prefer because it gives the message that a person doesn't need to be from an important lineage or legacy to be great. Ray being a nobody can be an inspiration to children who didn't have a great uh, childhood. Yeah, and, and I do agree with that too, uh, Nicole. I will say, though, that in my opinion, that was absolutely explained in The Last Jedi. That's, you know, Ryan Johnson drove that point home in the movie. Um, you know, Luke Skywalker going so far as to say, you know, talking about the vanity of it, to say that, uh, that you know, that if that dies, the light dies is vanity. It isn't everybody. It's just a matter of you going and tapping and tapping into it. Uh, thank you for the uh, for the comment. Black Eyed Lily, friend of the show. Um, I like the only hope as a title. Anything with hope reminds me of Kenobi, and I feel this bodes well for Ben Demption. I still favor a new order because Kylo said uh, it, it uh, said it in the throne room scene, and it could mean so many things. Uh, but I know we're probably all wrong. I was a big fan of Rey Kenobi before The Last Jedi. I really loved the symmetry of it. And I agree with you that there hasn't been enough of the Kenobi connection in the sequel trilogy. But after The Last Jedi, I really bought into Rey um, nobody. Uh, I really bought into Rey nobody for everything it stands for. Yeah, and when you when you look at the... And thank you, as always, for the comment, Black-Eyed uh, Lily. When you... Getting back into the creative process... Uh, and, and, and again, not a shameless plug to try to push my book, um, but just drawing from my own storytelling that I've been doing as of late when, at least for me, when crafting these stories, I placed things in the first book that I could potentially go and play with in the next book, not necessarily changing anything, but at least living a few things um, ambiguous enough to where I could have some fun with it if I wanted to in the next book. And if I didn't, it was no big deal, right? Nobody would think twice of it, but I did leave that option there. That happened now with The Force Awakens and with The Last Jedi. And certainly with The Last Jedi, and Ryan Johnson said as much, there is a bit of ambiguity in the... Um, ben and Ray scene on the supremacy after they wipe out the the Praetorian guards, and I mean even before that, when it comes to them both seeing a vision of of one another and and the conversation, you know, is 
Is is Ray really saying that she knows her parents are nobody, or is that just a guess? Is Kylo really saying that, or is he lying to her about what she saw? They left that open, and Ryan Johnson even admitted as much. Okay, so what does that all mean? Well, what I'm trying to drive at is that it really is just a matter of whether or not J.J. Abrams is going to go that way and what he does with that. For me, the easier thing to do is to do what was just said um, in, in the comment, and that is leave her as Ray nobody. You don't have to go back and change any of that. So if we just move forward in episode nine and there is no reference to that particular conversation or Ray turns out to be a nobody, then that means that in you know in, in episode eight that was absolutely true what happened and, and, and what both Ben and, and Ray were saying. But if J.J. Abrams decides that he wants to play with it, then he can go and he can re- reinterpret that. And that was the idea. It really is just a matter of, I think, how busy the story got and how big of the other plots how big are the other plots in the film and is there time to go and insert that in the movie and i personally think we'll get a pretty good gauge once we see the first trailer we actually know a bit about what the story is supposed to be i think that we can use that as a bit of a roadmap to whether or not J.J. is going to mess with the identity of, of, of Ray's parents if they are indeed not what was mentioned in Episode 8. If this is a complicated story, I think they don't mess with it. If Ray's parents are going to change, then I think it ends up becoming a big part of the story and not just something that gets glossed over. All right, Mackenzie Cassidy writes this, Before The Last Jedi, I hoped on the Ray slash Kenobi train. I hopped on the Ray slash Kenobi uh, train really fast. Um, following the reveal of her parentage in The Last Jedi, however, I'm much more impressed with the storyline Ryan Johnson presented to us regarding Rey being a nobody from nowhere. It took way more guts to go that route and ultimately a grand metaphor for how the Force chooses to move through whoever it wills. This is such a shift from the most prestigious Jedi Council attitudes in the prequels. Uh, Tracy Loveless writes this, The Only Hope is a title that I actually thought was a possibility, so I'm good with it if it's legit. Um, I also like Spark of Hope, too. Anyway, I originally wanted Ray to be a Kenobi and would still love it if that was the case. However, I also think it's too late to explain, kind of long lines of what I was saying a moment ago, to explain all of that without seeming like a retcon of The Last Jedi for many. What happened... Uh, with what happened with The Last Jedi, um, I think they will just move away from her lineage altogether. She's a nobody, and that's it. Anyway, great episode. I look forward to the podcast every week. Thank you, Tracy. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. We'll go to Silver Maiden 42240. I would love for Ray to be a Kenobi. I'm not sure if she will be, and I'm completely fine that if she isn't. That being said, if you want to make the movies rhyme, that's one hell of a rhyme. It would be perfect to tie all the trilogies together. The relationship between Obi-Wan and Anakin has such a tragic end, and there's just so much of an imbalance there. They were brothers. They loved each other, but the dark side destroyed that. A relationship between Rey and Ben would just repair and conclude the whole Skywalker-Kenobi epic duo thing in such a satisfying way. How cool would it be to see the Skywalker and Kenobi grandchildren get together and resolve all the negative karma while simultaneously saving the galaxy? together then they can someday have skywalker kenobi bloodline babies yes it's yes it's pretty predictable but that's why i'm not convinced they will do it but you got to admit it would fit perfectly thank you so much silver maiden i appreciate that friend of the show john poliska says this um let's see listen to the latest podcast and while working out and the concept towards the end is amazing. This is the Kylo Ren theory of him going around searching for relics. Of course, we as the audience know what really transpired for Anakin to become Vader, but I'm sure Snoke wouldn't have shown that truth to Ben. And would Luke have even mentioned it in the early days of Ben's training? I doubt it. Could harken back nicely to the different points of view in Ben's Fall in The Last Jedi. We all know tyrannical regimes whitewash history to serve their own agenda. So it makes sense the First Order would do the same. I'm sure Vader was sold to Kylo as the would-be true savior to the galaxy, and the evil Luke Skywalker betrayed his father and killed him, just as Kylo later explains how Luke turned on him. As Ben learns the real story of Vader, his feelings start to change, and the light that Rey brings starts to break through, thus forcing the dark side to unveil uh, the true master, uh, who, who's... Uh, 
who's to be determined but ends up dwarfing how evil Snoke was, which then forces Rey and Ben to unite against it. Touches on many relevant points. It's so easy for all of us viewers slash fans to fall into the trap of all characters knowing what we know, and that doesn't have to be true. Obi-Wan even did it. I thought Vader betrayed and murdered my father. What I told you was true from a a certain point of view. Um... Maybe I'm giddy like a schoolboy like you were, but it fits so well, links everything together so well. Um, you know, John, you you sparked another idea when it comes to the potential storyline and how this could play out with with Kylo Ren and 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 Vader to the point where I'm wondering if while let me think here, let me let me work this out because this is just kind of this is kind of flo- f- flooding into my head at the moment. Talking about the title, like I mentioned at the at the start of the show, having Skywalker in it, uh, I, I think that there's a possibility that that may be even more, um, even more possible than what I had thought based off of what's popping into my head now. Because what if that is the the inverse moment that we get in the movie with with Kylo Ren? You don't need to spend a lot of time sort of explaining that Kylo Ren hasn't fully understood what Vader was and who Vader was and that he has been duped this whole time into thinking that Vader was always this this evil individual not realizing that he fell from the light side to the dark side and that reveal could very much come in the same fashion as Obi-Wan having the conversation with Luke Skywalker in Return of the Jedi on on Dagobah when they final ha- finally have that conversation. Now, granted, we don't have the setup of that mystery in The Last Jedi the same way we did in The Empire Strikes Back, right? Um, the, the the sort of Luke, I am your father moment was, was uh, somewhat, I never really took it this way, but you could argue that it was the um ray your parents were ray you're a nobody moment um so you could then get into episode nine and that could have been a lie and it's like no you're not a nobody you actually are a somebody and that's a kenobi or whatever but at the same time i think you can do something very similar when it comes to kylo ren if this theory turns out to be true where he goes searching for the legacy of vader maybe we get a title that's in relation to that Maybe we get a title that this all ties back into the Anakin Skywalker story and Vader. And so somehow maybe it is the legacy of Darth Vader, right? Uh, you know, the, the 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 legacy of the Skywalkers or or something to that effect in the title. Again, there's got, I just there's got to be a better reason other than just starving the fandom for there not being a title. And now I'm thinking it specifically has to do with the fact that it's not going to be as uh, as ambiguous as The Force Awakens or The Last Jedi. It actually is going to have some specificity in it. All right, I'm just rambling. Let's get back to some of the comments. Um, let's see. Uh, Kilela13 says, Knowing what we know, I wonder why Lor Santeca was on Jakku. He said in the Force Awakens novel that he had made peace with his people. Was he really just there because plot? Or was there something special on Jakku? Since we have seen that it is highly likely they are going back to Jakku, will there be that novel scene of Plutt getting his arm ripped off, a call back to how Jabba had a bounty on Han? Will there be deeper, deeper meaning to what Ray thought she knew about her parents? So many questions. Uh, I want to see Taco Donna uh, again. I miss Ma- Maz, and I really hope she shows up at 9. I believe she's listed on the cast. I think she's on the cast list. Uh, She said in the last uh, Jedi novel that she wanted to look into Finn's eyes again. They made it uh, a special idea in the Force Awakens novel that when Maz first looked into his eyes and when she looked into his eyes again after Rey was taken, they were different. She looked into Rey's eyes, and I feel that Maz can see what Ben sees. It is really cool that they both saw the same thing, that her parents were gone, that Rey really knew. Sorry for the insane babble. Thanks for reading. I really enjoy listening to your podcast. No, man, that was great. Uh, that 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 was great. In terms of the, um, yeah, I don't know. The I, again, Star Wars does so much of the, of the. We're just kind of putting these people here, and you're going to go along with it. That I, I wonder if the Laura Santeca situation really was just about plot. But at the same time, I th- thought there was something else to him being there. I thought there was something in canon that had that had made a comment about there was a, a larger reason why he was. Why he was there. Anyway, uh, Cassiopeia Art says uh, says this. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, thank you for your optimism and positivity. Thank you. It's a pleasure listening to your podcast. You created such a peaceful place without hate. Just a pure love of Star Wars. Uh, thank you. <laughs> I love my Star Wars. Uh, it helps me survive uh, that impossibly long wait and crawling through the desert of no news. I don't understand why we don't have a title. We were all re- we were we were also ready on December first. It seemed like such a perfect time to reveal the title one year before the movie. Oh well, I like the only hope, but I think it will be something different. I prefer for Ray to remain nothing. Um, I I don't like the idea that everybody must be related to important characters. I'm waiting for a good Ben Demption story. I want to see, I need to see that it's possible to come back from the dark side and live, to atone, to accept the past, to teach others how to avoid your mistakes. I also want to see a balance of the Force in the union of Kylo and Rey, and I would like it to see that it's possible for a Force-sensitive child to have a normal, happy, and safe childhood in loving uh, and uh, fulfilled family. Uh, thank you, Cassiopeia, for the uh, for the comment. I really do. Uh, I really do appreciate it. Um, you know, and, and something again that just sort of popped into my mind reading the uh, reading the comment, and that is when it comes to Ben Demption, which I also believe is going to happen. Um, there's there's going to have to be a, a a pretty big threat. There's going to have to be something that. We'll leave the, you know, if we're going off the idea of satisfying, I also feel like somebody has to pay for what's happened over the course of the last two films this morning. I mean, not this morning. I'm sorry. The last two films. I'm in the middle of doing this uh, on Saturday morning now. This is the second part of recording listener feedback, and somebody had just messaged me, and so for some reason this morning popped into my head. Okay. There has to be – somebody has to pay for what's happened, uh, for what all the bad guys have done for the past two films. And so – um, I, I, again, I wonder what that threat is and what they have cooked up. I feel like it needs to be something that has the possibility of bringing everything crashing down, not just the first order taking over necessarily, but something of, and there's this talk of, of, of Palpatine returning and I don't know how you do it, but I like the idea of some larger threat that's been out there for a long time or has reemerged now that could End everything to the dark side forever, which makes the end and Ben's redemption even that much more powerful. Just a thought. All right. Uh, Amy, uh, Anne Thea Gaia uh, writes, as always, I love your show. Look forward to it every week. I love your Kylo theory. I think it would be interesting if Kylo was traveling around finding out the history of Darth Vader. I've always wondered if Luke and Leia ever actually told Ben the true story of Anakin Skywalker. That he truly loved Padme and fell to the dark side by trying to save her. That he saved his son by killing the Emperor and turned back to the light in the end. Was there a time after the truth came out that Vader was Luke and Leia's father for them to explain to Ben why they didn't tell him before Ben destroyed the Luke's Jedi Academy when he thought Luke was trying to kill him? I've always wondered why they weren't truthful with Ben. Uh, could the whole mess have been avoided if they had just been honest with him from the beginning? I wonder if we'll get these answers in nine, maybe in some ancillary material uh, later on. All right, and uh, let's do one more, and we'll go to Severin Weichman, who says this. Thanks for another great podcast. I'm pretty sure this is the only thing keeping me from going completely berserk from Disney's pro- prolonged silence on episode nine. I found myself watching any video on YouTube that is remotely connected to Star Wars, like Oscar Isaac's interview for his latest Netflix film, reruns of Adam Driver's previous SNL hostings, uh, various Graham Norton interviews with the late Carrie Fisher, anything. It's getting tedious. I understand, Severin. I'm right there with you. Um, about Ray being a descendant of Obi-Wan, I completely agree with you on the historical records view of the unfolding Star Wars stories. I think that if Ray were really somehow connected to Obi-Wan, I would be I would 100% respect it as Star Wars canon and be totally cool with it. However, I personally believe it would take away the mystery for the mystery that is Ray. I really love that she is a nobody, a, a peasant girl from a dusty planet who discovers her abilities somewhat similarly to how Anakin did in episode one. If Rey has to be connected to Obi-Wan to have her powers, then who does Broom Boy in episode eight have to be related for his Force abilities? Uh, Poe and Leia's bastard son? Sorry, that is so unorthodox. Thanks and keep them coming. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't certainly mean to apply that you have to be related to somebody who's strong in the Force to be strong in the Force yourself. The Rey Kenobi um, idea and why I liked it was more just because of Kenobi's relevancy. And I like the... 
I like the clashing of the of the, of the family idea. You know, sort of the 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 uh, uh, a a poetic way to repeat what happened in Revenge of the Sith with Anakin and Obi Wan. But this is now you know Obi Wan's bloodline taking on Anakin's bloodline with, and then and then finding a balance between between the two. Let me wrap on on this. Um, for the show this week. And again, uh, there's a quick promo right after the outro for uh, Embark. I hope you'll stick around for it. Um, uh, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But let me wrap on this. Moving forward, and I know this is not going to make people happy that are hoping for Ben Demption. Again, I think it's going to happen. Or, let me be more specific, Ben making it out of the movie. I th- There is a chance, like I mentioned earlier, but now that I think about it further, I think there's actually a... a Maybe a little bit more than a fifty-fifty chance that they that Lucasfilm and Disney do decide to stop the Skywalker bloodline. Um, it's a dangerous move, but if the idea is we're 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 going to move on from the Skywalker lineage and we're going to move on to other stories, and when we revisit the original saga through line, it probably makes quite a bit of sense that that would be lineage attached to Ray and Ray's lineage would be the new through line moving forward. Just a thought, right? Um, I love the idea that if it was Ray and, and Ben, then you can kind of have the best of both worlds. Um, I have always felt it a little strange that they continue to, to call this the Skywalker saga. Which is also why, again, I think that Anakin, some way, shape, or form, is going to be brought into. Um, you know, we'll know we we know we'll have Luke as a Force ghost, but I think that Anakin is in, is in some way going to be brought into Episode Nine um, because of the fact that and this is very, very sort of ancillary. I know that in in when it comes to actual bloodlines, it doesn't matter, but it's Ben Solo. It's not Ben Skywalker, and. And and I know that that's really really petty doing that thing with my fingers, but for me, I've always kind of been like, okay, I, I get it. He is the offspring of of Leia. Certainly, you know the the Skywalker blood, and Luke said that as much as well. I just always, in my head, I had a hard time. Well, he's not technically a Skywalker though; he's a Solo. And I know many of you guys have argued that it'll be the Solos moving forward, right? That'll be the continuation of the Skywalker bloodline, but it'll be attached to the Solo name. So there's that as well. Just something that I wanted to throw out right at the end of the show this week. So um, this was a big one. Thank you so much for all the comments. If I didn't get to your comment, thank you for writing. And I read each and every single one of them. And I do try to get to every single comment that I receive. Um, I may have to change that policy sometime in the future because I'm getting a lot of email every week. But for now, I'm going to attempt to stick to it. So we're just a couple of weeks away. I, I, I'm praying for some Episode Nine information. Right. I won't go in and rehash what I said at the beginning part of the show. But a couple of shows left before we are right into, uh, as a matter of fact, looking at the calendar. So that's one, two. So two shows. So two shows. And the third show, the third show from now, we should have way too much to talk about coming out of Celebration. And I can't I, and I can't wait. So two more shows before that. I hope you guys will stick around. Thank you so much for downloading the show again uh, this week. Uh, hang out for just a moment after the uh, outro for a brief uh, message about my book. Uh, and until then, may the force be with you. And now, speaking of Kenobi, here is the man himself. The force will be with you. Always. My nerd road. For Earth, the end is near. Only a reluctant hero and the girl he loves have the power to save humanity's future. It's the not so distant future, and car culture is replaced by air and space flight, made possible by two of Earth's largest corporations, flight mechanic Tap Guardia spends his free time racing through the skies with his three best friends and the girl he longs to be with, headstrong Kate Amaro. With the planet on the brink of an industrial apocalypse, a powerful and ruthless corporate madman, Sint Argum, moves to exploit the disaster with his covertly created military. When Taft, Katha, and their friends uncover a shocking secret, Sint Argum will stop at nothing to find them. Time on Earth is running out, but with the help of a ragtag group of young pilots, 
They'll fight for humanity's future and survival among the stars. My nerd world. Right now, you can go to Amazon.com, and you can pick up Embark, the audiobook, for, well, let me back up. You can pick up the ebook right now, and again, weekend special. I lowered the price again this weekend, just 99 cents, less than a dollar. So go to Amazon.com, search for Embark, E-M-B-A-R-K, and John Justice, John J-O-N Justice. Pick yourself up uh, the ebook, either for yourself, or you can gift it to <clears throat> a friend. This is a, this is a fantastic way, and I really appreciate it for you to go and support the show. Uh, if you're not a big reader, but you do listen to audiobooks, you can get the audiobook after you purchase the ebook for only seven fifty. You can also get the ebook for free by purchasing the paperback, which is available on Amazon.com uh, as well. As I mentioned, uh, this weekend I am finishing the first draft of the follow up book, and I cannot tell you how excited I am to get it out there. Um, writing the book has really, really helped me during this. Uh, this Star Wars news desert that we've currently been in, channeling sort of the things that I would love to see in a Star Wars film into the story and these characters and this world that I've created. So get the book if you haven't yet. That uh, kicks the whole thing off with the next book coming in just the next in uh, in the next few months. So again, go to Amazon.com, John J O N Justice, and uh, pick up the ebook for ninety nine cents, paperback for thirteen ninety nine, or with the ebook purchase you can get the audiobook for seven fifty, or if you're on Audible for fourteen. Uh, 95. Thank you so much for checking out the show this week. And for those that have purchased the book already, thank you very much. Now go to Amazon.com and buy Embark. I'll talk to you again uh, next week. I need someone to show me my place in all this.